All right, Larry, we're excited to have you on LT Talks and also be the feature on our upcoming issue of Experience Life. Thanks you for coming on. How have you been doing? I'm fantastic. I'm excited about being, uh, you know, the cover person. And um, you know, obviously, I'm a big fan of Lifetime, um, the brand, the lifestyle, everything that is associated with the company. And, um, you know, it's great to be with you guys today. Awesome. Awesome. It's our pleasure to have you. So. Yes. Let's talk about where you've been up to over the past 17 years. You've played at, with the Arizona Cardinals and included a trip to the Super Bowl in 2008 um, and multiple record-setting accomplishments along the way. So you made a conscious decision last season to step away. Can you talk to us a little bit about that decision and why it was important to do it on your own terms? Well, I mean, it's something that, you know, as you as you get older in your career, you start, you know, kind of looking at the landscape and figuring out, you know, what you want to do what your five-year plan is, what your 10-year plan is, and, 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 and it's going to be. And so what happened was I, I literally was just, um, you know, getting prepared for the season. Um, and I was like, man, I, I just, I'm just not, I'm just not really feeling it at this point. And, um, you know, so I decided just like, hey, you know, it's, it's that time. And I, I talked to a bunch of guys, you know, the Chris Carters and all the guys like that before. And it's like, you'll know, you'll know when it's time. And, you know, there was no, no question in my mind that I was ready, you know, mentally, physically, psychologically to, to move on. The good thing about it, though, I prepared, you know, for many, many years. You know, I first did my first internship at uh, at J.P. Morgan in 2009, a two-week seminar of financial literacy. And, you know, at that point, I really kind of just started diving deep into everything that was outside of sports. I knew I could play ball, I could play it at a high level, but, you know, there's a shelf life to being an athlete, and I wanted to make sure I was – prepared for when that transition was to come. You know, you never know in sports when, you know, either you're gonna decide to be done or the game will be done, decide to be done with you. And I just didn't want to get caught holding the bag. You know, you get hurt and somebody tell you that you're no longer needed and you're not prepared and you're not um, able to, to do anything that you really enjoy doing outside of the game. And so I, I worked really hard, you know, to prepare myself for that. Yeah, absolutely. And just building off of that, I mean, it takes courage to kind of step away from something you've known so well. So when you were thinking about that, like what example were you trying to set? I know you have you have children and all of that. So how how did that play into your decision? Well, I mean, it took everything into, into consideration. Talk to them, talk to family, um, talk to people I really trusted you know, in terms of their opinion. But all in all, you know, it's, it's your decision personally and, and what you feel is best for yourself and, and your well-being. You know, football is a very, um, you know, it's a tough sport. It's physically demanding on your body and the taxing, um, you know, occupation. It's not like, um, you know, sitting at a desk and, you know, being able to send and return emails and do things like that. I mean, it, it takes a lot of really, really, you know, physically um, demanding occupation, getting beat up and slammed down. And just it's just tough, it's tough. And so, you know, if you're not willing to continue to pay the price it's necessary to be great at that, you know, it's, you, you can, it's not a job that you can just kind of just put half the effort in. You gotta be fully committed. And I just wasn't, you know, willing to put that type of effort and commitment into it any longer. Um, but my kids were good with it. You know, they were sad initially, but, you know, they were happy to have me, you know, in their lives more frequently. You know, I didn't have to miss the practices and travel on the weekends and miss their games. You know, I've been able to do, you know, all of those things and, and be very supportive of them the same way they've been supportive of me. And and that's kind of the, you know, what, what I really based it on, you know, at the end of the day. I love that. Yeah, so Larry, you, you talked about a little bit of the, the physicality and building up that tolerance over the years. Uh, one piece that I want to throw at you is the, the mental resilience. And when you go back to earlier years in your life, what was that foundation? Like, who provided that foundation? Who was the early influencers in your life to allow you to become the, the young man that you are now? Well, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I see very often guys on the professional level, you have a lot of people who really – help shape you, you know, throughout mm -hmm. the course of your journey. And I didn't have to look any further than my two parents that were at home. They always set a great example for my brother and I to follow. You know, they worked in two completely different ends of the spectrum in terms of their occupations. My dad is a sports journalist, has been for 42 years in this one city's area. My mom uh, was on the non-for-profit side. So in like two completely different, um, you know, experiences. So, you know, for instance, I'll be on the sideline for the Vikings as a ball boy on Sunday and then on Monday, my mom will be hosting a charity event, um, you know, for 
people who were battling for their lives with cancer, or HIV, and AIDS. And so, you know, we saw a completely different end of the spectrum and it gave us great perspective on just the balance of life, how grand it can be and, and how hard it can be. And, you know, and finding, you know, what you can do to, you know, to make people's lives better, you know, what my mom did. And, um, you know, and so just trying to be able to have that balance and, and be able to focus your attention on the things that are really important. And we really able to, to, to get that, you know, in my time, you know, growing up from, you know, birth until I was 18 and I left the house. And so they always had a great example, you know, to set the bar very high. Mm, that's awesome. You've talked, you're, you're kind of talking about what's been important to you and what the influence of your parents. I know that you've had a lot of accomplishments on the football field, but I know you've also said in interviews that it's a lot of what you're doing off the field that matters most to you. And that includes philanthropy work and being an advocate and your foundations. Can you talk a little bit about that and why you've decided to focus so much of your time and effort in that space? Well, I mean, it's, it's the things that are most meaningful. You know, there's so many people I can point to and experiences that I can point to that really help shape who I am as a person. Like, you know, it was great that I could catch a football, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a pigskin ball that I caught. Like, I didn't, I wasn't working at Mayo Clinic. I wasn't, you know, finding um, different treatments to battle leukemia and, and lymphoma and saving lives across the world. Like, that's, that, that's not, let's not be confused. You know, I, I was, I was an entertainer and, um, you know, I don't place a significantly high value on that, um, even though I did it for a living. You know, I just have a, a great deal of respect for the people who really can leave an indelible mark on the, on our world and the people that live in it. Um, you know, just at the you know years from now, people will remember that I you know caught a hundred touchdowns or caught a couple thousand yards of, of receiving. Like that doesn't that doesn't matter. But the the young people that I'm able to positively touch, you know, with things that we do to our foundation or they will remember that. And, you know, cause I do, I remember being at Phoenix, or at Minneapolis Children's Hospital and, um, you know, being there getting, I had a little procedure done and I had to stay overnight. I remember Kevin Garnett coming to visit that hospital. I mean, Kevin Garnett didn't know me from Adam. He saw me in that hospital and he, and he, and he showed me love. I was down and, you know, he built my confidence up. And, you know, is that the reason I made it to, to be a professional athlete? You know, who, who's to say? But I just know he stepped out of his way. He didn't have to be there that day. He chose to do that on his off day. And, you know, it meant a lot to me. And so, you know, I, I take those experiences that I've had, you know, growing up and I try to do the, some of the same things that were done to me that made me feel good. And, and if I can just change one young person who, who maybe have, you know, without my mentorship gone a little bit off course, you know, if I can just help that one person to be able to, you know, fulfill his dreams, think about what he's will be able to do and, and what that would mean to him, to his family and to the other people that he's going to be able to touch. So like, it's just so much bigger, you know, when you can, when you can do things off the, off the field or off the court or, uh, you know, in your community that you live in. A lot of power and purpose is what I hear there. And you kind of said you, you had that foundation from your parents and now being able to give back. Granted, yeah, it was catching that pick skin and it was uh, even with all the accomplishments, you were able to take the platform that you had to utilize that to show others how to come across what identity and the power and knowing who you are and what you can do with your life. So with that, when you speak to, if it is young adults or kids, how do you now channel a little bit as far as your personal experience and how you speak to them on how they can get on their journey within theirs? Well, I mean, what I, what I see a lot in the, in the schools that I go visit, especially, you know, they're predominantly, you know, uh, predominantly African-American or Latino communities, you know, there's just like a, you know, you talk to the kids and you ask them, what do you want to do? And I mean, I would say 90% of them say that I want to be an athlete or I want to be an entertainer. And, you know, so just trying to talk to them about, you know, being well-rounded, you know, no matter, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a doctor or a lawyer or entrepreneur or starting your own business. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can, you can find success. And I just think that a lot of times in our communities, the only way they see success is through entertainment. And I just want them to understand there's a lot of different ways that they can do that. And it's tough for me to say that because I found my success through entertainment, but mm -hmm. you know, what's gonna sustain me for years to come, it's not gonna have anything to do with entertainment. And so I think it's important to be well-rounded. You know, I, I talk often about, you know, just, just being versatile and, um, you know, having a lot of different avenues that you can explore and not limiting yourself to to one mindset, you know, to one thinking, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can skin a cat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you just you mentioned mindset. And I'm wondering in, you know, a 17 year career, were there moments when it felt like it wasn't worth it? And how did you overcome that mindset? Or were there t- other times to reframe that question a little bit? Like, how did mindset influence you in the really hard times? Or how did you use that to your advantage? Well, mindset is everything. And, you know, that's, I would say that's probably my greatest attribute out of everything that I could do. You know, um, my mindset always was was pretty solid. Um, you know, anytime I went through some adverse, I could always, always, when I'm going through tough things, I always look back and I think about things that are actually really tough. You know, you know, I, I talked to guys, you know, in the locker room, man, I, I didn't get, I only had two catches last week. And I'm like, you know, I went to, I went over to the hospital last week and I, I saw a guy who was in a car accident, is paralyzed from the neck down. He's got a family of four. Like that's, that's real adversity. That's real tough. You know, um, you know, not catching a ball in a game is, is minuscule in terms of what, you know, the vision of tough is, is in the world. I mean, there's people all across our globe who, you know, haven't eaten a meal today, you know, um, and, you know, you go in your refrigerator and you have 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 different options of what you want to eat, you know, so like, there's real struggles out there. And so I always try to make sure I was keeping everything in the right framework. Right. Um, and so but that always helped, you know, I just have so many times I saw people actually really going through tough times. It, it really kind of just helped me like kick myself back into like the right place. You know, yeah, I didn't perform the way I wanted to perform, but it's a true blessing to be able to do something that you really love to do. And, um, you know, something that you always dreamed about doing. So it, it always, always was able to keep things in this proper place. I want to go uh, back to the purpose and, and Tim Hightower, I know we kind of connected on it earlier uh, before we got on and he always spoke to uh, Rick Warren's like purpose driven. He was, he was huge on purpose driven and um, he shared with me as far as who you were as an individual. He said he practiced every day hard, always looking to perfect his craft. Most veterans at this high profile level took days off. Larry did not. And then he says professionalism the way he dressed, the way he interacted with people outside of the building, he always was thinking about his image that he projected. When when I look at the time and energy that one puts into their craft, all those individuals that you just mentioned outside of football, whether it is a doctor or a lawyer, um, you know, somebody within a financial uh, business, they have to put time into their craft. How do you find the balancing act when it comes to uh, your day-to-day life with your kids and your family as well? Well, I mean, first of all, I appreciate Tim, Tim saying that, you know, I always really admired him and you know, getting a chance to meet his parents over the years. It, 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 it was really easily to see, easy to see, you know, the apple didn't fall far from the tree with the structure and um, just how, how wonderful his folks were. And Tim, all the things he mentioned about me, he was the same exact way in terms of his work ethic and his professionalism and his attention to detail and I remember him always talking about being purpose driven in, in, in life and you know it's something I really respected about Tim um, you know and I'm, I'm glad uh, you know to be able to you know call him a friend and, and be able to play with him for the many years that we were able to um, you know if everybody had his mindset and his ability you know we would be a much stronger league in, in, in general but you know it's always something that I, I saw and I just picked up as a child through different times I remember you know watching, you know, Chris Carter do an interview after the game and I would always see him dressed in a suit impeccably. And you know, I remember wearing a uh, you know, a jogger one day after an interview when I was a rookie and then Smith pulled me to the side and told me, hey, look, Larry, you know, the public only sees you when you're playing on TV, you know, and you always have a helmet on, you know, when you're off the field and you're doing an interview, you should conduct it in a suit, you know, look like a professional. So people can see that you're versatile and you're not just an athlete. You can do, you know, other things you're capable of it. And so you know, make sure that you're, you're dressing accordingly, and, you know, so just little tidbits like that would always, you know, really jump out to me in terms of how I would, you know, dress or carry myself in environments. And it was always, tough when you go into a public setting, you know, everybody knows your name, right? Um, you know, the easy thing would be just to, to greet people, but I, I always try to remember their names and occupations or their wives and, you know, make it make a point of it to, to make sure that they're, they're important to me. There's not just another person I'm just meeting in this long assembly line of people that are coming up to me. And so, you know, I was always trying to be very diligent in, in that. And, um, you know, that's something I, I picked up from people that came before me. 
keeping on this train for just a, another second, when you think of core values and beliefs for you, if you had mm -hmm. to name three to five, what would they be? Now, we used to always talk as a family about the faith focus and finish, something that we always uh, you know, talked about. Obviously, your faith is your foundation. Um, you know, you always have to be focused on the objective, focused on, you know, whatever it is that you are, you know, into or doing at the time and, you know, finishing, you know, what you started. You know, and, you know, it's something that we we went through. And I, it was another experience that I can go to. I remember my dad told me, look, Larry, you can either play on your eighth grade school team or you can play on your on your club team. Like I played before on both, but it was just really stressful for my parents getting me from school to practice. And it was just a lot of logistics that were, you know, kind of tough for them. So they, they, get, they made me make a decision. And, you know, my school team is with the kids. I was with every day I was close to, we had a great relationship. My club team was much better. We were able to compete on a statewide level. We had a bunch of guys that played, you know, at the next level in, in college. And so you know, my dad said, look, you know, there's, there's pros and cons of both, but you got to make a decision. I remember deciding to play on my school team because I got all the pressure from my classmates. And we didn't have the year, you know, that I would have liked to have. We were just a very average team. I was, the, I was like the most dominant player, but it wasn't good enough to carry us to, to a lot of wins often. And my club team was just like way better. I mean, it's just the competition was much better. But I made the decision in like a few weeks in. I was like, Dad, I made the wrong decision. I want to drop off the you know, the school team, I talked to the club coach. He said, I could still join the team and there'd be no problem. And my dad was like, no, that, that's not, that's not what we do. You know, you started something and you got to see it through the finish. And, you know, it's something that I still do with my kids. Like if you start something, I don't care. You got to finish it. You, you, you put that on your plate, you got to finish it. You know, it's just about setting a good tone, you know, not starting and not, and not completing things is not acceptable. And, you know, and so like those are the three things, three words that I would say, you know, really resonate with me the most. See it through. Yeah, I got to see it through. The focus, family and faith, huge. I love that. When you take some of the life skills that you've actually learned from the game and how you now apply that to everyday life, like what, what are some skills that you can now apply from your experience of being in the, the league for 17 years? Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot that I, w I could take, but you'd be surprised by how many are, are not applicable to what you do on a daily basis. You know, it's funny. Like if you were, that's why I always stress to athletes to, to really like, really pay attention to what's going on outside of you because I mean, it's very easy to get consumed and just being great at, at your own profession. But you know, if I was going a lifetime and I was looking to, to get into, you know, marketing or you know, real estate development or any other job that you would you would be interested in doing on your resume. Like ask you what experience do you have? And you know, all you could write down is I'm really fast, I can jump really high, I can catch oblong uh, pigskin balls at, at high velocities and um, you know, I'm really quick laterally. Like, yeah, all those are things are fabulous and we and we and we love that, but you know, that's not gonna help our marketing department. I just, you know, <laughs> so, uh, you, you you have to like really step outside of what you're doing in the game to, to develop some of those skills. And, um, and you know, what, what, it, what it does teach you though, is like determination, drive, focus, you know, like the, the intangibles, I would say the, the game does teach you that because it's highly competitive. It's, it's always changing, you know, you never know what the situation is, you know, you could, be on top of your your craft and not have a quarterback that can get you the ball. You know, what I mean, there's just so many things that that, that can happen and change uh, the landscape. You know, so it's important to be able to have all those intangibles, but also work on some of the things that you don't get in the sport. Mm -hmm. I would double down uh, and taking my personal experience. One of the things I would say that I, I learned from the game would definitely be the communication skills, and then understanding the individuals around us. We have a common goal, regardless of race or whatever it may be of how we can actually exist together. How do we now take this same vibe and the same feeling and relate it to the real world? So can it happen? Yes, we've seen it happen in this space. Now, when we go off this field, how we can now apply this uh, everyday life. So communication skills and, and also how to love thy neighbor were, were some big things that I was able to take away from the game for sure. Mm -hmm. So switching gears for a second, you know, you, we've talked a little bit about your philanthropy work. I know you're an, also an investor, and that's a passion for you as well. Um, podcasting, doing all that. But if you need to just relax and let off steam, 
what do you do to just take care of yourself? I would say my my favorite thing to do is play play golf. I would say I, I play a lot. I enjoy it. Um, other is like physical activities. Like I like to play pickleball. I play two or three days a week. Um, so anything that's like a workout, you know, get me out of the house and keep me active or things that I really enjoy to do. You know, when I'm just I'm just kicking back and relaxing. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit too. I know I read about travel being a passion of yours. You visited like a hundred countries or more. I think I read what, what about travel is meaningful to you? Well, travel is the one thing that you, um, you, you that you actually spend money on that actually makes you rich. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the experiences that you have mm-hmm. are like nothing I've ever seen. Um, and I could walk you on. We don't have enough time for me to walk you through so many like, life altering experiences that I've had, you know, from, you know, going through Vietnam and, you know, staying in remote villages, sleeping on the floors of, of people, you know, working in the fields at, at, at rice, rice, uh, rice plantations. I mean, you know, just listening to their experiences, the, the value, how much they valued your families, like just the small intricate details that I was able to learn by traveling, you know, it's, it's really enriched my life. And so, I think I've been to 108 countries. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to do much traveling over the last two years, you know, with the pandemic. And when my kids get older, it's just, it's hard to sneak away for, you know, two weeks. You know, you miss so much of their lives once you once you do it. But I traveled extensively from like 20 years old to like, you know, 32, 33. I mean, I I tell you, I globe trot it. That would be an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> if you could go somewhere tomorrow, where would you go? Um, so that's a tough question to ask. Is it, am I going with my family or am I going with myself? Well, let's say you're going with your family, just because I'm a family. I have kiddos too. See, that that limits where we can go. Because my <laughs> middle son, my middle son Apollo, like literally, when I tell you he doesn't eat anything, it's like Chick Fil A, <laughs> okay, Chipotle, Chipotle, Pizza Hut. So like that's cool at home. But if we were to go to like Africa on the safari. Yeah. He, he might not eat for two or three days. It's a, <laughs> that would be tough, yes. <laughs> so I, if I'm home, I'm going with the family. We love down, we love doing it in Mexico. You know, they love, they love Cabo, the beaches and pools and activities and everything that, that kind of goes on down there. They, they really they really like that. So on the family trip, it will be Cabo. Okay. Now I kind of want to know where you'd go on your own if you just had to pick one spot tomorrow. You know, Africa is like my, my spot. You know, I've been... I've been uh, the continent of Africa probably 10, 10 11 times oh, wow. and I just absolutely love it. I mean I've been to 35 different countries in Africa. Wow. If I had to pick one place, I would say my 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 peaceful place in, in the world is a place called Singida. It's in um it's in it's in uh, uh, Tanzania mm-hmm. and it's, it's spectacular. I mean just Paul Tudor Jones owns it. He's, he runs a huge fund out of New York, and he is big into land conservation and animal conservation. He bought this, you know, six hundred thousand acre land and put three different really, really amazing um, resorts on them. And it's all about conservation. So he hires locals, you know, guides and, and chefs and entertainers and you know he really believes in like building up the community um you know like the rhino population has has come back much stronger because of you know the things that he's done to keep the poachers away um and it backs right up into the serengeti so like it's um you know it's like like meshed into us and animals from serengeti coming to his property and like it's it's just unbelievable you know just to see the the beauty i love that picture like just yeah, in the I mind had the visual coming when you were describing it. So it's game time, I, I feel like, yeah. We're getting close. Yeah. I do want to ask one more question because I did see recently, Larry, that I, thinking about a global perspective that you have, and I recently saw that you did some work. Um, is it food footprint that you're doing some and raising awareness about taking care of our planet? So what's your what are your takes on that? I know it's something we're all talking about more, but where do you stand on that? And wh- what difference do you want to make in that space? Well, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, don't believe in the narrative. I mean, our, our world is changing and it's not changing for the good, you know, in terms of how we treated it, how we abused it. Um, you know, there's holes in the ozone. I mean, the plastics that we use are, you know, are 
you know, are killing our earth, um, you know, killing our oceans. And, you know, footprint is about sustainability, eliminating plastics from our world. Um, you know, the, the materials that they make, you know, they can be heated to over 100 degrees. They can be put in your freezer and also is biodegradable in 190 days as well. So I just really love what they're standing for. Um, they're about, you know, keeping our children safe because of the sacrifices that we're going to make, a lot of a lot of us won't live to see the sacrifices, you know, manifest themselves. But our kids and our grandchildren will, will be appreciative of the, of the sacrifices that we made. And so I think we just need to be more aware of those things. And, um, you know, they're a local company and I'm big on supporting companies that are homegrown here in Arizona, I uh, got a chance to meet their CEO, Troy and, and Yoke, and, you know, really get behind their mission. That's awesome. That's a big mission for Lifetime, too, is making a positive impact on the planet as well. So, Larry, anything else that you would want to share or add before I let David take you through his two-minute drill that he does? Uh, no, no, I think I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm, 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 a, I'm a good two-minute guy. All yeah. right. It's, a little, it's not the traditional one, but hey, we don't have helmet and pads on, but still uh, it's hot seat time. All right, so I'm going to ask five questions, and ideally we try to uh, answer them all within a two-minute time frame. You can go deep, though. I know you like to go deep. <laughs> all right, so here we go. Uh, what is the go-to for Larry Fitzgerald when it comes to mantras? I, I, I wouldn't say I have a mantra, so to speak, just just treat people well, um, just be honest, have integrity in this is decisions that you make and, you know, kind of let those principles kind of guide your life. Nice. Treat people well. I love that. OK. What book have you read that has made the strongest impact in your life? If I can only pick one, I would say probably The Alchemist. You know, it's uh, like I'm a I'm an optimistic person and Alchemist is like the most optimistic book that you've ever met, uh, that you've ever read. And I'm just a big fan of Papa Cohen and, and, and what he teaches, you know, it's about just being in touch with oneself. And, um, and I just really, really was moved by that book. Okay. All right. What's your favorite childhood memory? Um, a lot of, a lot of great childhood memories, but I would say, you know, like, Christmas or Thanksgiving, you know, with the family, you know, having all the cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents all together, you know, um, you know watching football for Thanksgiving or watching the five basketball games on, on Christmas and the fellowship and all of those, that those are um, things that I really, really enjoy. You know, as you get older, you know, the times when all the family can get together, you know, they, they start to join a little bit because as people get older, you know, families start moving to different locations. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're just not able to get together, you know, like you were when you were younger. And so I, I, I think back on those times fondly. All right. I know you said you're a very optimistic person, so I don't know if this one's going to land well. So pet peeve for Larry Fitzgerald, what would that be? Messiness. I don't, I don't like a lot of clutter. You know, I, I borderline OCD. So <laughs> it's just, I like, I like things to be needy. And if you looked around my house, things are, are tight. So my kids like that is he's, he's, he's hard on us about keeping the room clean and keeping things deep, uh, not, not, uh, like tidy and make sure they're not, not out of order. I would 100% agree there. Like at the beginning, for those who are listening and not seeing, like making the adjustment to the book that's behind him. So I saw it. I was like, all right, yeah, he, he's making sure everything's <laughs> on point. I like it. All right, here goes last question. What do you want to leave as a stamp of impact in the year of 2022? Oh, man. Well, I'm, I'm just leaning in heavily with my foundation work. You know, um, we're doing some really cool projects with Microsoft to put, you know, technology labs in, 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 uh, in schools. And my goal is to be able to do 30 to 35 additional schools in Arizona, in Arizona over the next year. You know, if I can do that, that will really be um, something I could, I could really be proud of. Awesome. That's so great. Well, Larry, thank you for taking the time with us. I know listeners, they can find more about you at your website, LarryFitzgerald.com. Find you on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. You're on all of them. I think I'm following you on all of them now. Um, and, and, and LinkedIn. And LinkedIn. Just <laughs> LinkedIn, recently. That's pretty recent, yeah. right? Yes. That's yeah. so great. That's when I... That's I had to start adulting a little bit. You know, so. <laughs> I know you're an adult when you have a LinkedIn, LinkedIn. profile. Yeah. So, oh, Larry, thank you so much thank for you. taking the time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You guys have a wonderful day. You too. All right. Bye.